In World War II, as the concentration camps were being liberated one by one, the sights that the soldiers saw were so horrific and at a level of evil that was just unbelievable that they began to worry among themselves that as they told the story that no one would believe them. So they began to document what they found by taking photographs of the emaciated inmates of the mass graves and gas chambers, the guillotines. And when the rest of the world did learn of the atrocities and the enormous number of people that were simply murdered, they were left with the question, how in the world could such evil, evil happen? And as they considered that question, they came up with two very different answers. It's one or the other, they said. Either that this evil is in everyone, and like a seed it will grow and sprout and, and become a menace if the conditions are right, and that this cruelty could be done by anyone. The second answer said, no, it did not anyone. This, this isn't in every one of us, but it's only in some people, like those who committed these atrocities. Certainly not within us. Now, these two answers provide and direct a very different solution for evil in the world. For if evil is just in a few people or some people, then when you find them, you bring them to justice. That's exactly what was done with the war crime tribunals and, and the trials at Nuremberg. But it was a little more immediate for the soldiers who found the Nazis at the camps. And many times they would just shoot the guards on sight or club them to death. After all, evil people like that, which we are not, deserved nothing better. But if the evil that would lead to something like a concentration camp was in fact in each of us and that every person if conditions are right is capable of atrocities and cruelty then shooting the guards even shooting all of them will not rid the world of evil and it certainly hasn't since World War II there have been numerous genocides which have been in even in our news like the killing fields of Cambodia, Rwanda, the Congo, the killing after killing. In fact, all you really need to do is just turn on the evening news and you'll see a fresh example, though not at the scale, but certainly evil nonetheless. And so it really leaves us then with the question of, well, what, what is the answer to evil in the world? Or is there an answer at all? This question sits at the very center of the Christian faith. Because if Jesus is going to lead and direct our lives, his answer to evil must be more than just a theory about, well, I think this is what it, what's causing it. He, he has to know exactly what evil is, its nature, its origin. He has to have a solution that actually delivers. He has to be able to take us through evil and take us with him out of it. Anything less or short of this doesn't help us. So, Jesus, what is the answer to evil? Tell us, where did it all start? How did it begin? And what's the answer? Someone must have asked Jesus this question as he made his way on his preaching tours. Because he took this question and his answer and wrapped it up into a nice little story, a parable of a, a wheat farmer out in the middle of a weedy wheat field. And his hired hands come and ask him, and keep in mind, this isn't a story about farmers. This is actually about God and the world and evil. And, but the, the hired hands come and they ask the farmer, God, why are there weeds? Why is there evil in the world? Did you do this? Was it by some design of yours or just sheer incompetence? Did you sow good seed in the world or not? 
And Jesus answers once and for all and gives us God's answer to evil. He says, no, I did not do this. An enemy has sowed these seeds. God did not create the world by design to include evil, cruelty, death, and destruction, mayhem. He created the world as a reflection of Himself and His goodness and perfection. And so it was in the beginning, but it is not now, obviously, because of an enemy who has corrupted and soiled His good creation. And so the servants in this parable that Jesus is telling, they ask the farmer kind of what we all really want to know. Well, what's your solution? You know, do you want us to get rid of this? So should we go out there and just weed the field? And, you know, who hasn't thought to themselves, if God is God and He's all-powerful, all-knowing, and He's all-good, why does He allow evil to continue? Why does he put up with his enemy who keeps sowing the seeds in this world? The servants want to go out and just pull the weeds and be done with evil. And that's really what we want too. You know, you can certainly go and to the playground, talk to the bully, put him in timeout, and, you know, that's, that's going to protect the, the other kids on the playground. Right? You, you can pull weed. And you, you, can, you can capture, apprehend, and prosecute the felon who has been menacing the neighborhood with violent crimes. You can lock that person away in the maximum security prison penitentiary up in Hutchinson. And that weed is taken care of. You can go in to another country, regime change, take out their government, put in your government. We did it twice, Iraq and Afghanistan. But none of this has rid the world of evil. Well, well, why not? Why can't we just pull the weeds? And the answer in the parable, which Jesus is giving so that we might know God's answer to evil and why he can't or won't just remove evil, is that the weeds and the wheat, evil and humanity, are too tightly bound at the roots. You can't just see where it's bound. It's below the surface. For evil is not simply the, the things that are growing up top that make the news. It's not the domestic violence in which the husband has stabbed the wife to death. It's not the, the terrorist who shot up the airport terminal with a handgun. Evil is a root system. It has a root system in which there is a thinking in the heart that then grows into what you see. At its very root, evil is first and foremost a rejection of God as God in your life. Now we heard from Paul in Romans, and that's how he began his book, his letter to the Romans that all humanity has turned against God and we've gone our own way. We have rejected the Creator and now we have placed ourselves and our wants, our people, our way, and we will go to war with anyone who gets in our way. And there is the thinking in the heart that it certainly doesn't grow into genocide every time. That's kind of the, the biggest plant in the garden. But what normally happens are the little sprouts that we think are very innocuous. In fact, we don't even think it's all that bad to have a garden with a few of these weeds. But it is from the heart of evil as well. And it, it goes something like this. It's the heart that thinks to itself of another person, well, I don't like that person. I don't, I don't, I don't like the way they're talking. I don't, I don't like the way they look. I don't like the way she's dressed. I don't like the way he smells. I just don't like the way you're talking and you, the, your ideas. And I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to avoid you. I'm going to make fun of you. I'm going to blog about it. I'm going to do all kinds of things so that you know that you're the other and I am the good. It's the thinking in the heart 
that is jealous and envious of another's success, beauty, or promotion at work. It is the demand that my opinion be honored, listened to, and respected, and my wrath feared. It is the judgment of the heart that you're not worth my time even to be bothered with. It is the expectation that my prayers will be listened to by God and given what I ask simply because they're my prayers. These little sprouts, we don't really concern ourselves with too much because they're just everywhere. Everyone has them. And as we look at the world, there is a lot of good, and we're capable of doing a lot of good. Most people want to do good. But all people are prepared to do evil if necessary. And all too often, the conditions are just right to do just that, evil. So we hear in this parable that the farmer will not allow the servant simply to remove evil from the world, because the root system of evil and humanity is too tightly bound. To pull one will be to pull us up. And so the judgment of God is to let both grow until the end. That is quite a judgment. Because it's a realization that we're not going to get better as people. As much as we would like to rid evil of our own lives... No matter how much willpower, no matter how much effort you put into it, these sprouts will continue to grow. No matter how much you're threatened with pain or suffering or even hell. And so the judgment of God is to allow both. And I don't know if you've thought through exactly what that means, but it's quite a hopeless judgment because it means this world as we have it is not going to get better. And the optimist in us is always kind of waiting for tomorrow. You know, finally when I, when I feel a little better. You know, finally when our family gets settled down. Finally when I get the, the job we're, we're looking for. Finally when the world can get along with one another. But it's never going to happen. It's the most hopeless judgment of God against us. And it would be hopeless without Jesus and what he did next. See, there's no other religion in the world, none, who even claims that their leader or their, the one who started that religion or, or their, their God did what Jesus did. What did he do? Jesus took responsibility for all of the evil in the world. Who's ultimately responsible for the Holocaust? Jesus said, I am. Who's ultimately responsible for human trafficking here in Wichita? The opioid epidemic. Or the way you yelled at your spouse. You're cheating in school. Who's responsible for all of that? Jesus stood up and said, I am. No other religion has their God take within himself the punishment and the wrath of all that is due us. None but Christ of Christianity. Why would Jesus do this? Place himself in the utter darkness, in the forsaken of his own Father, why would he put himself in a, in a place where all of our cruelty against evil people would be meted out in and on his body with the thorns, the lashes, the nails? And the answer is love. It's who he is. It's what he's like on the inside down to the very root of his being. He is love. And he loves you. He is more committed to you than a husband is to his wife. He is more committed to you than a mother is to her only daughter. He completely and thoroughly loves you. And if you're like, are you sure? 
Look at the cross. What more does he have to do to convince you of his love? If, if you can look at that and say, I don't know, does he love me? He takes within himself the responsibility for your personal evil and the wrath of God against it. And in so doing, there at the cross, he has the power and the purity within himself to make you and the world right again. For he has conquered the enemy who sowed the seeds. He has delivered us with himself from death to life. And it's once, once this love of Jesus and the truth of what he's done for you and the new life that he's given to you, once that truly seeps deeper and deeper into your soul and into your roots, you begin to look at the world differently and see evil differently and your fellow neighbor who's just as bound at the roots as you are to evil you look at it all differently. St. Paul, um, not St. Yeah, St. Paul wrote these words, and he was somebody that lived in a world in a, at a time that is at least as evil as today, with as much as domestic violence and war and crime and natural disasters, and yet he could write, because of this hope and this truth in Jesus, he wrote, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. The reason that he could write this with such confidence and faith and trust is that Jesus truly has taken on and conquered the enemy. Because he truly has taken the responsibility for all the evil in the world. Because when he comes again, he is going to restore creation itself. He is going to renew our bodies. He is going to go and weed the world of everything that causes sin and death and destruction. And you, who have been made holy and righteous by the blood of Jesus at the cross, you and I will shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. Because this is true, you really can't have a God like this on a part-time basis. You really can't just have this God available to you when, you know, you need a little help, a little boost. You know, you need a little, little religion in your life. This is the kind of God who has your entire life, to whom we bow, to whom we give reverence. But it's not out of fear of pain or hell, but out of love. For his very nature of love, we've been invited into it. And as we grow in that love, he's our everything, our life. May the Lord bless you as this grows deeper and deeper into your soul. To the glory of God, amen.